Good morning, Mr. Bruce uh, uh, Blackwell. My name is Mosumola Okumolaji, and I'm from the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program. And today is March 18th, 2022. We're so happy to, you know, have you here with us to do this interview. So I think we'll just get right into it. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Where were you born? When were you born? Sure. I was born on June 9th, 1941, uh, in the hospital in Providence, Rhode Island. It's called the Homeopathic Hospital. And I laugh later on in my life saying, hmm, I think there's something about the name of that hospital that, that uh, was foretelling what my later life was going to be. But anyhow, we lived in a suburb of Providence called Riverside, Rhode Island. And uh, I was there the first 10 years of my life and developed an appreciation for nature because we had a house at the end of a short street, a cul-de-sac, so, and to the back and on one side it was all woods. And then for me to go to elementary school, I had to go across the street, down a hill, across a brook with a little bridge, and then up the hill and then to the things to get to school. And I was fascinated by things in the brook, things like the, the tadpoles and water striders, these things that are on top of the surface of the water, uh, and some of the plants around there. The, there's a plant called Touch Me Not that uh, when the seed pods ripen, they burst open and send the seeds all over. But if you get to them and they're just about ready to burst and you touch them, you can do this. And that was sort of a fun thing. It's, it's a wonder I ever got to school on time. Uh, so that was the beginning of my life. My parents, my father was a public school teacher and my mother, as was typical at the time, stayed home. I had two brothers and a sister and enjoyed, enjoyed the freedom of, of that time. Then unfortunately when I was 10, we moved to the other end of town, which is called Rumford, Rhode Island, uh, all part of what is called East Providence. These are just hamlets or something in a neighborhood that was just, I thought, horrible. Uh, the backyard was a postage stamp. We had, we were on a bus route. The buses went by in front. Uh, I really hated being there. Mm -hmm. But about three blocks away, there was the municipal reservoir where we got our water. And I soon found that as a place to go and find the nature that I wanted, which was good. While doing some walks, I, I don't know exactly how it happened, but one of the neighbors further up the street uh, was an astrophysicist from Brown University who had a son younger than me, but who was a little bit, um, maybe a little bit slow. I'm not quite sure how to do it. And they had been recently, he had been recently divorced and, and would take the son out to the woods and do bird watching. Yeah. And that got me going in bird watching. I had not done bird watching until that point. But the bird watching, which was all fine and good, got me thinking about other things, the habitats of the birds. Why are they in certain locations? Uh, the, the, the seasonal patterns, all sorts of things. And that got me into the, the wider picture. Uh, it just, you know, it just sort of flowed. And then I started going into Providence where the Audubon Society of Rhode Island had a very small headquarters and got to know there were just three people that worked there. There was the executive director, Roland Clement, and Alfred Hawks, who was the educational specialist who went out into the schools, and a secretary. Uh, and that was it. But they encouraged me to continue my bird watching. They had bird watching walks that I could go on, uh, tours, you know, where groups would get together. Uh, and 
after a few years, they bought a house on the east side of Providence, three-story house. We moved in, into that, and uh, a woman in the town in Rumford corralled me to, on Saturday mornings, take my, my mother's vacuum cleaner and go with her to clean the place. I mean, everything was done volunteer with, as with many nonprofit organizations. It wasn't much money to do anything with, but we did it, and we had, you know, we kept things going. Mm. Yeah, you, you've mentioned a lot of things about, you know, the environment and how you kind of fell in love with nature generally. Did that kind of impact your career in any way? Yes. Um, and also, uh, I, I'm a fairly determined person when I, uh, I think I have a strong sense, I call it New England, uh, of right and wrong. And I always like to see right and I like to see wrong punished. When I was about, only about 15 and, and going around the reservoir, I, I had a newspaper route about for 80 customers, uh, the afternoon newspaper. In those days, it was morning and afternoon, uh, six days a week. And I saved up enough money to buy what at that time was called an English bicycle. It was a narrow tire with a three-speed shift on the handle. And uh, I fitted it out with a speedometer, odometer, so I could see how many miles I had gone, and also with a with a generator for a light front and back, uh, rather than relying on a battery one, I, I thought this was a better thing. Not that I did an awful lot of night riding, but uh, you know, I did that, and so I went around the reservoir. I had gotten to like a bird called the osprey, uh, which is this wonderful fish hawk is another word for it. And they had a nest year after year at a very protected sort of an island at one end of the reservoir. But suddenly one year, one of the ospreys was killed, uh, was found dead, shot. And there was somebody shooting, trying to get the other one. Well, I found out who it was, and it happened to be the son of a local judge who felt privileged. Well, the, os the osprey is protected under the Federal Migratory Bird Act protected in uh, Canada, United States, and Mexico. It's a federal offense to kill an osprey. Mm -hmm. I contacted the local police department to see if I could get something done. They wouldn't touch it. I, I contacted the state police, and they said, no, they don't do policing in the metropolitan areas where there is another police department. I contacted Fish and Wildlife, they mostly patrolled the pots of Rhode Island that were the undeveloped pots, and they didn't want to do anything. I was angry. So I made a call to U.S. Fish and Wildlife in Washington and explained what was going on. Actually, their, their headquarters in, is in Patuxent, Maryland. They sent out an undercover detective who came. I was very impressed. Uh, <laughs> in a, an unmarked car uh, with a trunk full of license plates that he said he could change when he wanted to. And any time a police department ran it through the system, it would come back, file not found. Uh, he had a two-way radio, and radio's been one of my interests, that was tucked inside the glove compartment. And the experts at Patuxent had outfitted what looked like a regular radio antenna with all of the length that was needed to do the shortwave broadcast that they were doing at that time. I mean, it, it was really a nice setup. He spent about a week out in the woods. Uh, he had a, a portable radio that he brought with him, a bulky thing. He never could catch the kid shooting. But he went, he made an appointment with the father and went to see him and said, we have, to the, I wasn't there, but this is what I was told. We have evidence that your son has shot an osprey, which is a federal offense, and continues to do shooting around the reservoir. Now, you have a choice. You can stop your son from going out there and shooting, 
or we can take this to federal court. Well, the father was not anxious to have his son in federal court, and so he agreed the son would stay away from there. So he, I never saw him out there again, but he and his friends harassed me constantly. They ran around in their fancy cars and, and uh, hooted and hollered and shouted things. I didn't really care because I had won. Uh, the environment had won, laws had won, uh, but I was only 15. Yeah. I was, I, I think some people might call me a precocious brat. Uh, <laughs> I was a little precocious. School bored me. Uh, when I was fif 14 and 15, I actually attended night classes at Brown University in uh, conservation things. Uh, my mother had to drive me there because I couldn't drive, I was too, or I would take the bus. And I did well. I mean, I was by far the youngest person there. But it was just something. I was restless, and I wanted something to do, and I wanted something to do in the sort of field that I enjoyed doing something with. So that was, that was part of what happened at that time. Yeah, at just age 15, that was commendable. <laughs> I guess I was probably just running around at the age of 15. That was really commendable. I just, I don't know how really I got the bug in me to worry about what was called conservation back then, it's now the environment, mm -hmm. and try to do what I could. Uh, I went to college in Rhode Island, Rhode Island College, to be a school teacher. It was the family profession. My father and his two brothers were school teachers. Their father had been on the school board. The children of the uncles were teachers. I mean, it was just sort of accepted that uh, that was, which I thoroughly, thoroughly wanted. I got caught in a problem at college because you had a math major and science minor, or a science major and a math minor. Uh, it was ironclad, that was what you had to do. I have never been able to do math. I'm hopeless at it. And I'd like to blame it on the fact that I found out later on I have this dyslexia. I have, I still have trouble with figures. I have trouble writing. Uh, when I go to write a word, I'm apt to start with the end of the word. Uh, and I can tell you in typing papers for college, <laughs> at the time when you, you did not have computers, you had typewriters, you had whiteout, but most of the professors did not really want a paper that had a lot of whiteout on it. Uh, it was very time consuming. But I, I, was a, I didn't know what to do. I had befriended, I had, I had a part-time job as head of the language laboratory there, and I was taking courses in French. So the head of the French department stuck her head out and neck out and said to the university, we will make a one-time course of a French major and a science minor. Now, I didn't really want the French. I was not interested in being a French teacher. I was interested in being a science teacher. But this is a way of getting a degree. So I did it. And I got my degree after some things went on. Uh, but when I went to get a job, there were, it, this was for secondary schools, there were no job openings in science. And I ended up teaching French, which I did not like. Uh, I guess I did a good job because my principal was upset when I turned in my resignation and wanted me to stay. And the kids wanted me to stay. You should see the letters that came in. Uh, but when something else came along, I decided I wanted to do it. Also, and I don't know, well, this is actually an aside about something that's, that's in the forefront nowadays. In my elementary school days, I never had a black student in class. We had none living in either of the neighborhoods I lived in. Okay. When I got to junior high school, there were some black students, but I never had classes with them because they were all, there were tracks. And 
they were all in the vocational track. You had vocational, commercial, and college. And I was in the college, so I never had any contact with them. It wasn't until high school that I ever had a class with a black person who excelled. Uh, he was better than me. Uh, but in, in spite of this or because of this, I don't know what, I have no feeling about people from other places. Uh, I enjoy cultural diversity in the enrichment, uh, but I, that's just sort of a side thing that, that happened in my life that at the time, obviously I didn't think about, but I've had time to look back and say, yeah, I had this experience which was completely white. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I never heard anybody in my family or my friends talking discrimination, uh, but it was, the neighborhood you lived in and the people that you, well, so that was something that was, also, what was this? Yes, I realized fairly early on, I can't tell you when, that I was gay. Uh, obviously scared to death. Um, and I went through all of school including junior high, senior high, and college, without ever meeting another student that I thought was gay. <laughs> it was very frustrating. Uh, so I have to say I was sort of intellectually gay. I knew I was gay, but I didn't have people to be gay with. <laughs> <coughs> now, during the time I was in college, at some point, I attended a lecture with somebody from the University of Rhode Island who was talking about the value of salt marshes. Uh, salt marshes, this professor said, are more, provide more nutrients per acre than the best farmland out in the Midwest. And I started thinking about all of these marshes that are being filled in. They're being used as dumps, they're being used as housing sites and all of these things. And I decided that was wrong. Somebody had to do something about it. Mm. Well, the state of Rhode Island did not have any laws against dumping in salt marsh, had no salt marsh laws. But I was determined to do something. And with a little bit of help from the Audubon Society, they found a pro bono lawyer for me. And I started arresting truck drivers who were dumping in marshes. That made me a little bit uncomfortable because it wasn't the truck drivers that were responsible. It was the people who hired the truck drivers. But according to the law, you need to get somebody that you say is breaking a law, even though there wasn't. And we went to court many times, and I had experts come up from the university, and, and we lost every single case. Mm. But the Providence Journal, the newspaper, the in one newspaper city, latched on to something and decided to hire a, a writer to do just conservation. And the issue began to get very good press. And I, we did not go, we could have appealed to the state Supreme Court, but the, the pro bono lawyer said he wasn't willing to be pro bono to go there because the amount it would take was just intense. We finally crafted a law with the help of the professors from the university. And rather than show a line on a map and say, this side is salt marsh, that side is water, it talked about the plants and had the plants determine what is a salt marsh and what is not. Because mm -hmm. salt marshes, as part of their evolution, are sometimes quite dry. They're not wet all the time. So people would say, well, that's not a salt marsh, that's dry. And then I would go back and photograph it at a, at a king tide or something like that. And I say, well, you know, it, it. so this answered that question by making it according to plants. The legislature took up the bill and the night before they were to take their final vote, and I was very apolitical. I was only interested in what I was interested in, which was what's this issue. I am told, and I did not question who did it, but I am told that the 
head people in both the Senate and the House found cases of whiskey in their cars when they left work that day. <laughs> the next day, the bill passed. Wow. So we had, so I, I lost every single skirmish, but won the war. Now, I say I, I'm the one who stuck his neck out. Uh, the Audubon Society was very helpful in the background at getting people who could show up in court and so forth, but they wanted strictly to stay out of the publicity of it because it was negative publicity at that point, and they didn't want negative publicity. I didn't mind that. I, I, I could completely see that, you know, the, the good guy, bad guy sort of thing. Uh, but that was something I, I got done and I was very proud of. Even, even when I was teaching, I brought a suit against the um, yacht club of the town where I was teaching, where most of the, uh, the school board members were members because they were uh, proposing to dredge and then fill the salt marsh with the dredgings. Uh, lost that case too. People said, you're crazy to go against your school board. And I said, I don't care. You know, I was young. I was living at home. I had no dependents. I could do this. If they wanted to fire me, they would fire me. Uh, wouldn't make any difference. Uh, so that was, that was an interesting phase of life. Oh, I forgot to mention, going way back to <laughs> the, the kid who was shooting at the reservoir. Uh, I confronted him one day in there, and again, remember, I'm 15, and he told me to get away and not do this anymore, and he shot at me. Wow. I would say six inches or so from my head with his 22. Uh, I do not believe he wanted to hit me. I believe he wanted to scare me. But all of that just made me more angry and made me, that's when I got down got through to Washington and, and uh, I was just, I was very angry at that. Uh, so I, I have this determination when I'm, when I, when I have a project and I think I'm right, I want to follow it through. Uh, some people think it's a little too much. Okay, they can think it, I don't care. Uh, and I'm still, I'm still sort of that way. For a good cause, I think it's, it's, it's a good thing to do, you know, to follow through with your plans. So I wanted to take you back a little bit to yep. when you mentioned that the first time you had uh, an interaction with a black person was in high school. Yes. Did that um, interaction kind of shape how you see other people from different cultural backgrounds, like subsequently? I don't know, because uh, I hadn't been exposed, again, I hadn't been exposed to people from say South America or Cuba or Haiti or, or, or Puerto Rico, anything. They hadn't been in my classes and, and even through high school, I don't think we had, well, what we did have, yes, we did have people from usually the first generation or second generation from Portugal and from the Azores. A lot of Portuguese workmen came to Rhode Island, came to New England and uh, worked. So I did have some Portuguese. No, I, 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 nothing put the idea into me to see these people any differently than I saw anybody else. Uh, you know, I could read the newspaper, I could read about uh, certain groups of people being blamed for, for crimes and so forth, and, and sometimes it seemed out of proportion to the population of that group. Uh, but it didn't make me feel anything against. No, I just didn't feel against. I don't know why, but I, I just have always had this, this open feeling. Okay. While I was in college, I, uh, the, well, one of the things that, I guess it was, yes, I had to be in college. In Massachusetts, they had started something called conservation commissions, where each town was given the charge to uh, enforce conservation rules within their boundaries. It started to seep over into Rhode Island, 
and I seized on this as a wonderful idea. So I started promoting it, and the town that I lived in, is East Providence, which is now a city, appointed me to the East Providence Conservation Commission. And I was on that for quite a few years, spreading the word. I, I went through a period of speaking to a lot of garden clubs, uh, rotary clubs, all sorts of things. I can't tell you the number of, of uh, chicken, mashed potatoes, and, and gray peas dinners I had. <laughs> that was sort of typical at the time when you went out for something. We ended up with a, a large network of conservation commissions being very active in Rhode Island, and I was elected president of the Rhode Island Association of Conservation Commissioners at one point. Somehow through this, through my conservation work and the salt marsh work, the governor of Rhode Island, John Chafee, seemed to think that I had something to offer. He decided that he was going to put out a bond issue f to purchase open space, the first time this had ever been done in the state of Rhode Island. And there was a committee of about 25, and he named me to the committee. Now, I was by far the youngest person on that committee. I was probably 22 at the time, and most of them were industrialists and, and uh, bankers and, and uh, retired people and so forth. Uh, and the executive director of the Audubon Society. We got along very well. Governor Chafee was, he was a Republican governor who felt that the scales should be even, that social programs that were necessary had to have the fundings to take care of them. And he didn't think either one should outweigh the other. He also, being a Yankee, was very conscious of money. And he said, now we have this bond issue. You're not getting any money to publicize it. You individually have to go out into your communities. You have to write letters to the editor. You have to do all sorts of things on your own. Uh, it was a great challenge. Uh, we did get printed. I, I guess he may have paid for it little door hangers that said support the, the uh, bond issue coming up. And I, devious me, uh, on it, uh, got a rubber stamp with my signature on it and put, made sure that that was on each one. And my kid brother and I went around and hung these on doors all over the place. The bond issue passed, uh, mm -hmm. passed very handily, which we were glad. Then the governor said, now that that has happened, you are going to have to, this board is going to have to, called the Green Acres Commission, you are going to have to pick out the parcels that we should purchase. That was much harder than selling the program because the field is wide open to try to purchase things. We mostly settled on trying to protect waterfront areas, waterfronts of rivers and, and different things like that. Uh, I managed to slip in the reservoir that was near my house, which had been a, a municipal water supply that had been abandoned because it was polluted, mm -hmm. uh, uh, but had that put in as a, they didn't have to buy anything, they just designated it as a, a uh, park, I think. Uh, but that was quite a, that was quite a feat. L later on, Governor Chafee uh, in 1965, at the annual meeting of the Audubon Society, uh, and I had already left Rhode Island at that time, pre presented to me a wonderful statue of a, of a bison, American bison, with a thing on there, a plaque, presented by the National Wildlife Federation as the first conservationist of the year in the state of Rhode Island. Wow. And I'm 24 years old. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, at that time, in the 60s, there were active students in war protesting. But other than that, the students weren't, weren't all that involved in things. Mm -hmm. I had trouble at the college. Uh, we were to educate children, 
And at one point, the legislature decided that they, they had uh, scholarship money that they always awarded to the seniors. And after they had done that several months, they decided their budget was running low. And they decided that they would cut out all the scholarship money. Well, the kids had already applied to colleges and things. Mm. Many of the high school students went out and protested. They marched and protested, which at that time caused a lot of trouble in their schools. They were, they were given demerits and all sorts of things for daring to do this. So I got angry and I said, we're going to educate these students. We, as college students in the program, the, the College of Teaching, should take a stand and we should support the students in trying to get those re reinstated. I wanted to do an, a march of students. I couldn't get any students to follow me. So I decided to instead write a petition supporting the students. And that, I got a lot of signatures. And that's the one that's in the, the photograph here of me somewhere here. I think that's it. Yeah. Well, I don't know. It's of me on the steps of the State House with the petitions. Uh, when I went to do this, uh, Oh, I had, I had so much trouble with the governor. The governor, I kept, is that okay? The governor, the governor's secretary kept saying he didn't have time to have a meeting with me when I had all these signatures. And he didn't have time, and he didn't have time. Didn't have time this week, he didn't have time next week. She didn't know when he'd ever have time. <laughs> well, then one night in the paper, it said that the head of his uh, political party had made an unannounced visit and they'd had a two hour meeting or something like that. So I picked up on that and went into the newspaper and said, it seems strange that the governor can meet with his political head, but he can't meet to take a petition on the students uh, about reinstating the scholarship money. After that came the invitation to see the governor. Mm. But I was not allowed to have the press with me in the governor's office. Uh, that's why they took the picture in front. And when I went in, the governor said, put him on the desk and leave. Uh, didn't bother me. I had, after that, suddenly the scholarships were all reinstated. Wow. <laughs> um, which was only right. You can't take away something after people have already planned it. I, it was a horrible thing to do. Uh, I don't care. It, it, people, the president of my college was very upset with me because it was a state college. They depended on state money. He was buddy-buddy with the governor. And he called me in and, and gave me a lecture on things. It's sort of like what's happened uh, recently with the University of Florida with some of the things. <laughs> um, the out, the out fall of that was that uh, the president would not allow me to receive my diploma uh, with my graduating class and cross the stage. It was mailed to me. Uh, I didn't make a deal, big deal out of that because to me, it just showed how little he was and how much I had gone in there and I had really, really gotten to them. And that was fine. That was fine. I, mm. You know, I, I can do that sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. Like, based on your narrative, you, you seem to have a lot of experience with um, activism and advocacy. And I'm just glad you mentioned like one of the challenges you faced, you know, while trying to advocate at uh, the university. That's that's really that's commendable. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah. Well, by 1964, I guess it was, I was anxious to leave my teaching of French. I really didn't enjoy it. I hadn't had any. Uh, nothing had come up in the secondary market for science teachers. I'd had one. In this, I'd had one experience teaching. Uh, back in high school, the high school science teacher was not particularly good as a science teacher, in my opinion. And he was a, 
a part-time lawyer and a teacher and, and even though he lived at the end of the street and I was friends with his son, I didn't think he was very effective. And, and I did things in the class that he didn't like. We were supposed to be dissecting frogs and I refused to dissect the frogs because I said it was completely foolish. We weren't going to learn anything from it. Uh, but at one point in one of the days he said, well, if you think you can do a better job, come on up here. So I did. <laughs> Now, I can't say I did a better job, but I taught for the rest of the day. Um, he never asked me again. Wow. Uh, I just, I, I have that, you know, thing of doing things. So in 64, I was sending out uh, resumes to things like National Audubon Society and Nature Conservancy to see if I could find jobs there, which would continue me on the path of what I really wanted to do. And National Audubon said they didn't have any openings. But an offshoot of the Nature Conservancy called the Natural Area Council wrote to me and said they had an opening. They had an opening on the island of Martha's Vineyard, which was about 75 miles from Providence. I had never been there. They wanted to have a year-round conservation organization started and they were looking for someone to do it. If I'd been older than 24, I probably would have realized what a terrible job that was. Uh, but I didn't know it, and so I said yes. And I resigned my teaching position, uh, left teaching on a Friday and started my new job on a Monday. Uh, I went to the island twice in the meantime and, and found a place to live. Didn't know anybody. Didn't realize until I got to the island of Martha's Vineyard that anybody from the outside is automatically not important. You don't pay attention to people from the outside. If you're not born here, forget about it. Uh, I also hadn't realized that the island of Martha's Vineyard in 1965 did not have zoning. Uh, I, I just took it for granted that zoning was something that everybody had. No. No, and they didn't want zoning. Uh, the one thing, the garden club had gotten through all of the, and the island of Martha's Vineyard, which is only about 25 miles long and 15 miles wide at its widest point, has six different towns, six different town governments, six different police departments, six yeah. different school departments, six different fire departments. It's a comp plus a county service that does all of these things too completely absurd. Uh, it, was a, it, was a, it was a challenge. I, one of the fun, interesting things was when I set up my office was making a phone call and, and uh, now living outside of Providence, we're not the center of the universe. But when Martha's Vineyard, when I picked up the phone to make a phone call, someone said, number please. They didn't have dial phones in 1965. So everything had to go through an operator. Long distance calls were something to try to get through. But anyways, I did my best. I had a very good backbone of supporters. Uh, yes, part of what I was supposed to do is raise my own funds for my salary. <laughs> um, and they were influential with the summer group, but the year-round people had no use for the summer group, and I was seen as a, as just a, a, a worker for the summer people. I had to try to establish myself, and it didn't go very well at the beginning because the summer people, people who started this, had a road at one end of the island that they wanted to not ever take place. It was to go across sand dunes and nesting places for some of the birds, and uh, it was in the end of the island that used to be a, a, an Indian uh, territory called Gay Head. And the people of Gay Head, the Indians, wanted to have a road that went down to a, a port of safety, a little cove. But the people backing me, and, and I agreed fully, without any zoning, if you put a road down to a place like that, you're leaving it wide open to things like uh, houses, bait shops, 
maybe restaurants, who knows all along there, um, which wouldn't be good in the long run. The, the town fathers at that point, who were elders, uh, said no, they didn't intend to do that, but it wasn't in writing, uh, and there was no zoning against it. So we went on back and forth, and at one point, the Wampanoag Indians organized, and they went in full head gear, headdress, around the State House in Boston protesting what I was doing on Martha's Vineyard. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was, and at one point, I used to go to all of the selectmen's, they're called selectmen, to the selectmen's meeting each week in each town to figure out what they were doing and to present myself. And one night I had a call from the head of the selectmen in Gay Head, and he said, are you coming to our meeting tonight? And I said, yes. And he said, well, the select board would like you to know that uh, we cannot guarantee your safety once you cross the border into our town. Wow. Uh, that stunned me. It made me angry. But uncharacteristically, <laughs> I, did not do, I did not do what I would, in many cases, have done. I did not go right to the press and say, look, I've been threatened by these people. See what this did nothing about it. I didn't go to the meeting. I didn't make a cause out of it. Uh, it the Indians themselves were, the younger Indians were the ones who opposed my opposing the road more than the elders. The, the elders, I'm sure, did not want to see anything go along the roadside. I think they were very, because it went across some ancestral cranberry grounds and, and different things. A very short distance, it's under, under a mile. Well, this went on it, because of their marching around there. It was in the New York Times and the Washington Post, and it was a whole lot of agitation. One of our the members of one of the backers had strong political influence in state government in Massachusetts. And so the head of the public works department, I think it was, decreed that that road would be built. And it would be built with state money, and it would be a limited access highway with only two points of access. One where you turned off the paved road to go down toward this port, and the other one coming in by boat. It could never be anything cut into it. Well, some of the Indians were not very happy with that. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, since they weren't going to be paying for it, uh, that sort of smoothed them over. And about a year after that, in, in 66, uh, well, that probably was in the spring of 66 that this finally went through. For the summer of 66, again, thanks to influential people that were on the board, uh, the Secretary of the Interior, Stuart Udall, and his family came to Martha's Vineyard, uh, and he dedicated in this town of Gay Head something called the Gay Head Cliffs, which are these multicolor cliffs, which in their heyday were beautiful. They're not as good now because so much has been washed out in this vegetation. But it's got a plaque up there. It's a national registered natural landmark. And that was a big thing for Martha's Vineyard. You have somebody from Washington come down and do something like that. The same head of the selectmen that said he couldn't guarantee my safety called and said, can you come to my house for dinner? and?" try to help us plan for this event because we don't know what to do. <laughs> so we had many meetings and things went off very well. And I, characteristically but foolishly, and Stuart Udall had six children. Uh, I invited he and his wife and kids to a cookout at my place <laughs> by myself. <laughs> <laughs> and I did it. Mm -hmm. uh, I was kind of frazzled, but uh, they seemed to enjoy it. Uh, I think particularly the kids enjoyed it because the parents could be, most of the time the parents were invited out and the kids were not invited, you know, that sort of thing. So it was fun. But that was, a, that was an interesting part. Mm. Uh, then, if I want to be honest about this whole thing, about my life, 
I lived in a town, a port town, town of Vineyard Haven. Uh, there was no postal service door to door. You had a post office box in the post office. And you had to go into town every day, which was only a block from where I was living. And you would sort of listen for the, you'd listen for the boat whistle of the mail boat when you knew the ferry was coming in with the mail and you'd go down there. But I would poke in and out of all the stores there. And there was one store in particular which uh, intrigued me. It was called the Flea Market. And uh, they had a gallery upstairs. And then they had antique furniture and accessories. And, and uh, it was different. It was different. Uh, I think Brandy called it oddments and figments at one time. Uh, and in fact, on one of his business cards, he had down the flea market, the juxtaposition of the incongruous. Mm -hmm. uh, he started the business in 1954. His family was from Martha's Vineyard, as I said, and, uh, or I think I said, they came in 1640. And they had a house, and he could live there. And he brought a partner from New York, and they had an apartment in this house, and decided to leave their New York businesses behind. And the first year in a small rented shop, they mostly sold things that Brandy had sent back from the war. He was in World War II, and he was in Saipan and uh, uh, Okinawa. Uh, but on his t time off, he was head of, as sometimes the military is wont to do, he graduated from Rhode Island School of Design in interior design and architecture. And so he was sent to basic training in camouflage and all that sort of thing. When he was assigned in the South Pacific, he was assigned to be head of the motor pool. Oh. Well, his knowledge of motors was you turn a key in and either it starts or it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the military for you. Uh, but it gave him a Jeep and access on time off to travel around these islands and get away from the war zone. So he collected things that had been left behind with the obliteration and sent them back to his parents. In Okinawa, he found a sake table, which he brought back to his tent and was so taken by it, he made drawings. I don't know. Yes, he probably took photographs. I, don't, I think he must have had a camera. He had been working for a furniture company called in New York. <laughs> <laughs> and he wrote to the head of the furniture company. And the head replied he liked what Brandy had shown. It was kind of impossible to ship this to New York. Uh, but with careful drawings and scale and everything, he paid Brandy $500 for the rights to it. And it was produced. It was called the Okinawa Table. And I have a, a cutout from a, a magazine of architecture or something where they were advertising this. And why can't I think of the name of that company, a very well-known high-end uh, Baker, Baker Furniture Company. Mm -hmm. And it was Mr. Baker, Hollis Baker Sr., that he was involved in. So that was kind of an interesting thing from his war. Also, he, he did some sketching, watercolor sketching, while he was there to show everything but a war zone, all mm -hmm. the peaceful things in the countryside and the people. and, and uh, uh, yeah, he, but he sent back a lot, and he opened a store, and then moved to a larger location in 1960, and and uh, because he was able to purchase a building, and we were there until the 70s when the town became overrun with day trippers, and we decided to move to the country, and op we bought an old red barn and called it the Red Barn. Mm. <laughs> um, but. So I got to know his shop, and I got to know him. And he was 26 years older than me. And for no reason in the nothing in the world that makes any reason, if I want to be honest, I fell in love. Mm. Never 
in my life would I have expected this? This was, if I was going to be with somebody, it would be more my own age. Mm -hmm. uh, but it happened. So after a while, I resigned my Vineyard Conservation Society job and went in as a partner in his business, which we owned until 1996. Uh, and it became not through any plan, but it became a destination. And uh, we tried, we never made much money. If we broke even, that was pretty good because we plowed money back into keeping the grass mowed, keeping the uh, outside painted, uh, making sure that nothing was falling down. Uh, it, this, and we were the first gallery on the island, there weren't too many galleries, that sent out full color postcards announcing the, the artists that we were having shows for. Mm -hmm. uh, we also had strict uh, rules for the shows that we picked the artists that we wanted to show. Some galleries you could pay a certain amount and you could hang in their gallery. Bernie said, no, they have to prove their worth. And if they're worth it, and we think they're worth it, we'll stick our necks out and we'll support them. And so we sent these out. Uh, other galleries had a wine and cheese at their receptions. We never had food, but we opened up a full bar. And then I played a little trick. We still weren't as well known as we would like. We weren't doing as well as we would like to. So for our gallery openings, I hired a, uh, an off-duty policeman to direct traffic. Now, at the beginning, there wasn't an awful lot of traffic to direct. But the mere fact that, that somebody was there directing traffic, anybody going by would say, hmm, you know, maybe there's something there that I should look at. Mm -hmm. uh, it eventually came so that we had full parking lots. But, and, and also, uh, I didn't want anybody who had been at our bar to go out tipsy. And I thought that having a policeman there might discourage anybody from overindulging. Uh, we, never had an, we never had an incident, thank goodness, in all the years. Uh, but that was sort of a... You know, that was sort of a tricky thing to do. Uh, in 1993, one of our customers came in and said, I've been invited to President Clinton's birthday party. It was his first year in office and his first year vacationing on Martha's Vineyard. Mm -hmm. She said, I need to bring him a birthday present. Do you have any suggestions? Uh, I was blank of suggestions. But Brandy, um, I have to go back a bit. In 1987, uh, we received a phone call in June from Time Life magazine saying that the famous photographer Alfred Eisenstadt, who had uh, taken the photograph, well-known one, of the sailor kissing the nurse in Times Square, and who was a personal friend. We, he had become a friend of Brandy's years ago, and he and his wife, when they visited in, in August, we always had dinner together, and uh, uh, we just had good times together. He asked her to see if he could have the first ever worldwide show and sale of his work. His work had never been for sale before. Mm. My initial response was, that's impossible. The season's been set. All of the artists have been lined up for their specific weeks. And she said, well, you think about it and call. I'll call you back in a couple of days. So Brandy and I put our heads together. We talked. It had to be in August. We talked to a couple of the artists and said, would you take your two-week run and turn it into one week? And we'll put in Alfred Eisenstadt. Eisenstadt was very well known on Martha's Vineyard. He would give lectures every summer, and they'd be standing room only. Uh, the artists agreed. So when New York called back, we said, yes, we will do it. It was 
it, it should have been a no-brainer at the beginning. I wanted to be faithful to the people we'd committed to. Um, you know, I mean, straight, straight. Um, it was a fantastic success. And we continued in our gallery, which is still going strong, the Granary Gallery, continues to show his works and sell his works, even though he's dead. Mm -hmm. So anyways, this woman came in and said she needed something for Clinton's birthday. And Brandy Eisenstadt had just come out with a new book. And we had signed copies. And he said, why don't you take this copy of Eisenstadt's book? Eisenstadt is up in Menemshire at the inn where he stays every year. Call him, go to see him, have him write in something personal to the president and use that as your present. She thought that was good, and she did that. Well, apparently at the birthday party, uh, the president said, oh, this is wonderful. I'm a fan of photography, and I like his work very much. And then she said, well, he's having a show right down the road. And Clinton said he had to go to see the show. Yeah. So there was a lot of back and forth, and. Uh, you know, combing the place with Secret Service, and, and uh, <laughs> we couldn't say anything to anybody. Uh, we could only have our own staff present. Uh, all of the visitors, all of the other people had to be excluded. It was all set up for one day, and then at the last minute, uh, they called and said, it's off, there's been a leak. Well. It was a funny thing. Eisenstadt had been on the phone with a reporter in Boston, and someone came in and said, well, it's time for you to go down and meet the president. So oh. he said, he didn't, apparently did not say he was meeting the president. Oh, I have to go meet somebody important right now. Goodbye. <laughs> and the reporter oh. put two and two together. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so it was scrubbed. Yeah. So, it was set up for the very last day they were going to be on Martha's Vineyard. And it worked. They came. And we had things. We had drinks, sealed drinks for each one of them, uh, what they prefer to have. And the first thing the president said when he came in through the gate, I'd love a cup of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was something we didn't have. But we lived upstairs. We had built an apartment upstairs at that point. So Brandy went up, and his sister was upstairs. And they made a pot full of Maxwell House coffee and brought it down. And uh, the president, in a lot of photographs, is seen holding coffee because he had quite a few refills. Uh, later on, the Secret Service said to, to Brandy, uh, well, was, was that tasted by? before you gave it to the president? Brandy said, no. And they said, oh, that should have been. Well, it was decaf, wasn't it? And Brandy said, no. And they said, oh my god, he's going to be wired all day. <laughs> and actually, they stayed with us for about three and a half hours. Wow. Uh, the first half hour, the press pool was allowed in to take photographs. And then they were sent out, and it was just a private gathering. and. You would think that it would be a very nervous-making time, but he and Hillary had a way of putting you completely at ease, making you think that you were just the next-door neighbors or something. I mean, mm -hmm. there was no nervousness about the whole time, and they were there about three and a half hours. Uh, at one point, even because we had music playing over some speakers, Hillary said, oh, this is good dancing music. <laughs> and Brandy said, well, shall we dance? So they did a little dance, yeah. uh, never recorded, because it was after the, you know, when, they were, when the family could be alone. And the president went through, after Eisenstadt had gone over his photographs and explained them, he then again took Chelsea and went around and said, now, look at this one and, and see this part of it and this. He was really something. Okay. We, in previous years, a few years previous, had purchased a copy of the Declaration of Independence that was printed on toile in eight, eight, in, seven, now let me see, it was 1776, 1780, I believe, I have to get my, um, it had been sold in 1944 
at an auction in New York at Park Burnett Gallery of Americana to the late husband of one of our customers who then disposed of it. And we purchased it. We thought it was so historic. But it was not anything that was uh, flashy. I mean, it was mm -hmm. dull. It was sort of ecru color. Uh, the framing needed to be redone. It was sort of falling apart. Uh, and we would bring it out 4th of July and place it in the shop, and people would ignore it. Uh, <laughs> when we heard the president was kept, and we th always thought of sending it to New York and having it sold at a, an auction. Mm -hmm. But the thought of shipping it deterred us. We never could figure out a safe way of, of sending this. So when we heard the president was coming, we decided, why don't we make this a gift to the country? Mm. So that's what we did when the president was going along the wall. And you can see that in one of the photographs here. This one. Okay. Oh, yeah. You want that? This is the moment that I'm handing him the photograph. Now, our customer had kept the auction record. Mm -hmm. So we had the complete, is this OK? The complete provenance of it to tell him. His eyes welled up. I thought he was going to tear. <laughs> he said, I'm a history buff. You don't know what this means to me. Wow. Uh, so as we went, went along with that, I said, you know, We'll put some bubble wrap and stuff around it, and you can send somebody to pick it up later. And he said, oh, no, I'm taking it with me right now. <laughs> and That's right. he did. <clears throat> in 1994, we were invited to every Saturday when he was on the island. He did a Saturday radio address from a place on the island, usually one of the island schools. Well, we were first, we were, we were invited to the tarmac to greet Air Force One when it came in. Mm -hmm which was an Air Force One. It was actually a helicopter. No, it was a smaller one that came in from the Cape, because the big Air Force One wouldn't fit the Martha's Vineyard runway. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're invited out there, and people like Rooney and Jordan were in line. I mean, we're with you know, big wigs, and we're, at, we're absolutely nothing. We're, mm -hmm. we're nobodies. But he wanted us there, and then he wanted us to be at his radio addresses. We went to all of them the years that he was on the island. And he said it the first time he met us in 94, I've had that reframed, and it's hanging in the personal, our personal living quarters in the east wing of the White House, and we'd like you to come and see it. Yeah. Well, that was too good to be true. But in, in August of a year, we couldn't, it, it, wasn't the, it wasn't the right time for us to go to visit Washington. But every winter, by that time, we were spending winters in Fort Lauderdale and then going back in May to open up our business on Martha's Vineyard. So I started corresponding with the people that he said to get in touch with at the White House. And I said, uh, and May happened to be Brandy's birthday month. I said, uh, well, we'd like to visit with the president on the 19th of May, which is Brandy's, will be Andy's, Brandy's 80th birthday. Well, the staff said, well, uh, yeah, he's a very busy man, and things happen, and we can't guarantee any such thing. But give us a few days on either side of that, and it will happen. So that's how we left it. And, and they said, keep in touch. They want to know when we left Fort Lauderdale, keep in touch as you head north uh, with our three cats. Uh, and this is before cell phones. Okay. <laughs> uh, so we tried to stay in, in touch. Uh, we were in, I think it was South Carolina. We stayed at usually inexpensive motels like Motel 6 because we can get a room in the back and we could bring our three cats in uh, <laughs> without being seen, without declaring that we... Get, a lot of these places didn't have a policy for or against pets, but we... A lot of places did say no pets, and we wouldn't go there. Mm -hmm. And we would tell the cats to be good and be quiet. They never caused any problem. They never went outside the litter box or did any clawing or anything. But when we would come back from dinner, <laughs> if you've been in a lot of the motels, there's a, an air conditioner unit usually at the window, and the, the drapes are there. 
they would go behind the drapes and they'd be sitting on the windowsill looking out the window. <laughs> so much for hiding wow. them. <laughs> but in this, this one Motel 6, there was this pimply faced, probably 16 year old kid that was manning the night, the desk when we said we're going out to have some, something to eat. And then I said to him, we're expecting a call from the White House, so please take a message. Well, he looked in sort of a, yeah, OK, fine. <laughs> we came back from dinner, and he's all, the White House called. The White House called. They want you to call them. <laughs> I, I mean, what more improbable thing could somebody have said to this kid than, oh, we're expecting a call from the White House? I mean, so I'm, I'm sure he's gotten mileage out of that story, too. <laughs> yeah. But we did get into Washington. We stayed wow. at the Washington Hotel. I had a big crate, uh, wire crate, that the, we could put the cats in when we were out of the room. So if anybody came in, they couldn't get out. And we got to the Oval Office for Brandy's 80th birthday. Great. Looks great. <laughs> and then that was one day. And in that day, we also went through. They gave us a tour of the, the below grounds, where they have the the florist shop. They have a huge floral shop there because, of course, they have flowers all around the White House and all the special functions. Uh, we also, while we were in the West Wing went into the office, and they had a cat named Socks, a black and white cat. We could, Socks was sitting, as, as many cats will do, she was sitting on top, she or he, I'm not sure, on top of the uh, copy machine where it was nice and warm. <laughs> but we were allowed to pick up Socks and be photographed with Socks. Uh, <laughs> and then we were invited to come back the next day to go into the East Wing, which nobody goes to because that's the personal living quarters, and go up and see the document on the wall. And actually, it was taken down, and we were photographed holding it. I have those photographs in the apartment. Uh, so it was quite a special two days for people who are just little people from nowhere, mm. not contributors to either political party, uh, just this thing of being in the right place at the right time, yeah. uh, it's just incredible. Uh, it, so much has happened in my life that way that these things have come along. So we, we thoroughly enjoyed the White House part. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's, a, that's a great recollection of you know, your founders' memories and just also uh, your great accomplishments as well. Yeah. And it's, it's yeah. great to yeah. hear all of the yeah. stories. Yeah. One, of, one of the things when I was back in Rhode Island, here we go back, track a little bit. Narragansett Bay is this wonderful bay that, that dissects Rhode Island, goes all the way to Providence. Mm -hmm. And it was so polluted, it was terrible. My father used to talk about when he was a boy swimming quite near Providence. Well, you wouldn't <laughs> dare go in any of the water, and you couldn't take any shellfish or fish or anything. And I thought that was wrong. So since I had somebody at the newspaper who would write a story if I wrote it, there, a headline came out, angry young man calls Narragansett Bay an open cesspool. <laughs> uh, that provoked a lot of reaction. Oh. Some of it positive from conservationists. Some of it very angry from people like legislators, politicians. Mm. You know, I wasn't going to be deterred. So I found a friend with a boat and a television station with a reporter and camera and a couple of local politicians. And we set out to take a tour of the shoreline and could see the outfall pipes coming out from places, including one private club that they all belonged, that the pilot, many of them. Uh, they had to see it firsthand. Uh, they couldn't deny it when they saw it. Mm. I didn't stay around long enough to do 
much with that, but uh, a group called, I think, Save the Bay was started, and they have been doing cleanup over the years, and now, the last couple of years, there have been fish in downtown Providence, and shell fishing is allowed quite close to Providence now. Um, it's really made quite a difference, as it should be. It shouldn't have been used just to dump into. Uh, but as part of my research for that, okay. the sewer plant operators that were along the bay kept saying, well, you know, this is complicated and we have to discharge in there because blah, 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 blah. So I took night courses for about a year and I became certified to run a sewage treatment plant. Wow. I learned what goes into it, what goes out of it. And it's amazingly simple. The only drawback in getting a good effluent out of a treatment plant is money. Yeah. <laughs> the more money you put in, the cleaner the water is coming out. It's as simple as that. Yeah. It's not a complicated science thing. It's money. Yeah. Uh, and people said, you're a sewer plant already? <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> wow. uh, I like to find answers to things. I, I like to find the truth to things. Okay. Um, and when somebody says it can't be done, that's always a way for me to go around and try to prove it wrong. Mm, which is great. And I think, uh, Mr. Blackwell, we could transition a little bit about, you know, the, a little bit on the history of the Oak Hammock. You've been like one of the founding. Yes. Yes. Um, residents here at the Oak Hammock. So Brandy how did you hear about the Oak Hammock okay. and how, why did you choose to? Well, it, again, by accident, we had a friend in Fort Lauderdale who said one day, well, you're not going to see me anymore because I'm moving to Gainesville. Mm -hmm. Now, Brandy and I were not interested in sports teams, uh, had no knowledge of Gainesville. So we said to him, well, isn't that just some sort of place out in the woods up there? Mm -hmm. And he said, well, my daughter is very important. She's running this new organization and, and so on. And we said, well, have her send us some information. Well, his daughter was Star Bradbury, who was in charge of sales here for a long period of time. So immediately, I think they came by airmail at the beginning, she started sending us brochures and brochures mm -hmm. and brochures. and. By this time, Brandy was getting, as we all are, getting older, but he, he'd had a few falls. He'd not broken anything, but uh, his eyesight wasn't as, well, there were problems. A and finally, I don't know quite which happened first, but one time I came in and Brandy had been home alone and he had tripped and he grabbed a, a marble bust of, of uh, Beatrice, Dante's Beatrice, mm -hmm. and brought that down, and she was headless on the floor, and there was blood all over the place, mm -hmm. and I followed the trail of blood, and there was Brandy in the bathroom trying to stop the blood from his head. He didn't break anything, and he didn't have a concussion, uh, but it was one of the many times I had to call 911 because I couldn't stop the bleeding. The head mm -hmm. is just full of blood vessels. So we said, I said, probably, let's go up and see this. Okay. We had no idea at that point what a CCRC was, Continuing Care Retirement Community, mm -hmm. uh, foreign to us. So it was February. We came up to Gainesville. We stayed over at the, mm -hmm, the inn on uh, University Avenue across from the school department, uh, Sweetwater Branch Inn which was a lovely place to stay. It was cold weather, which we enjoyed. Uh, it was freezing at night, and then it was bright days in the daytime. The sun was out, and we thought, this is perfect. We're from the north, and the year-round heat in Fort Lauderdale was getting to us. The only seeing palm trees in Fort Lauderdale was getting to We longed for real trees and things. And Gainesville is almost a... It's a divider. It has 
southern things and northern things. Mm -hmm. So that appealed to us. The, the campus of Oak Hammock, because it's so natural, appealed to us. And then the way you can transition through life. <clears throat> you can be independent, but then if you need a little help, you can go into something called skilled nursing. <clears throat> Sorry. Then if you need more help, you go into assisted living. But you're all under the same roof here, so all of the friends that you made can see you if you're in one of these other things. Uh, and I like being near a university teaching hospital. When we lived in Fort Lauderdale, we did all of our doctoring in Miami because the University of Miami had teaching hospitals down there. Mm -hmm. uh, so I liked that. I liked the proximity to that from Oak Hammock. Uh, the, the downtown is so close to Oak Hammock. And we love performing arts. And I looked up the schedule of the performing arts at the Phillips, and it was mind blowing. It, it was more going on here, thanks to the university, than we had in Fort Lauderdale, mm -hmm. which doesn't seem possible. It should have been the other way around, but no, we had it here. So we ticked off all of the boxes, and the only one that we questioned was the airport. Uh, not as convenient going anyplace, because you basically had to change fairly quickly to something else. And then we realized we're not traveling much anymore. Yeah. So it doesn't mean that much. So we picked Oak Hammock, and it's been 16 years. It's worked out well. When Brandy, when Brandy got to the point, he'd, he'd lost his sight. He was uh, legally blind because of macular degeneration. Uh, he'd had one knee replacement, but then when the second knee gave out, he was 97, I think, then. Uh, the surgeon who did the first knee said he, was, he would do it, but he questioned whether Brandy wanted to go through the rehab at that point. And at that point in life, and Brandy didn't have any cardiac problems, luckily, but at that point in life, there comes the question of trying to figure out, well, how much more is there, and how much do you want to go through? Uh, and Brandy decided he would rather not have the operation, even if it meant being in a wheelchair. Um, and we got along quite well in the wheelchair. Yeah. So it, it came to the point where because he was getting up a couple of times at night to go to the bathroom and I had to be with him, uh, he'd get back into bed and he'd fall fast asleep. Sometimes I would, but sometimes that would get my mind racing. I'd be all going. So I wasn't sleeping very well. And I think it was probably a housekeeper who sent word to the social service director here. And she had a conference with us. And she said, I think that your situation is intolerable and can't go on. And I think what needs to be is that Brandy needs to go to skilled nursing and spend nights there. And then he can come back and be with you the rest of the day. Well, that was a perfect situation, is they could get him ready for bed. They could get him up at night. In the morning, they showered, shaved, dressed him. Then I picked him up. We had meals. We went out places. Two weeks to the day before he died, we were at University Auditorium for a concert. No. Uh, he never lost his mind. He didn't have his sight, and he didn't have his walking, but he had his mind. Uh, and. Uh, I think Oak, being at Oak Hammock prolonged his life. Uh, it took away a lot of pressure because he felt he felt pressure too, uh, and and things like medicines uh, now were mostly given down in in the skilled nursing part, so he didn't have to worry about the medicines. Even though I would have doled, I was doling them out and everything. There, there were just all of those reasons, and and. I haven't had any reason to regret being at Oak Hammock since then. Mm -hmm. And I've gotten myself involved at Oak Hammock. <laughs> uh, I am now on the uh, residence council. I've run for that. I've been on it before. It's a 12-member group that's a, uh, a it's, is, uh, voted on by the membership to represent the membership to the administration and to the board of directors. Mm -hmm. And then I'm 
currently chair of the dining committee. I'm a member of the building and grounds. In my previous time on the residence council, I was chair of building and grounds because that's really uh, what I like is, is the grounds, not the buildings, but the grounds. Uh, and other assorted things that I get involved with here. Uh, I'm, I'm, I was invited to, and I'm a member now of the, the Gainesville Athenaeum Society, yeah. uh, which meets at Okamic. Uh, I keep a very full calendar. After Brandy died, I decided to throw myself back into the environmental movement. And when we, I should say, I didn't leave it entirely. When we had the art gallery, we would have uh, fundraisers for some of the various groups, like the one that I started, Vineyard Conservation Society. Uh, we would uh, donate things to auctions uh, mm -hmm. for various nonprofits. We were we were involved in the community. In fact, for Brandy's hundredth birthday, the town of, of West Tisbury, which is where our gallery is located, gave him an award for what he has done to promote the arts on Martha's Vineyard. Uh, which was very nice. I mean, we tried to promote artists that were good. Brandy had that background, and he could, he could tell, according to his criteria, whether a person had really studied. Enough. He wanted to make sure, always wanted to make sure people knew drawing before they did other things. So they knew some of the basics mm -hmm. before they did the other. And not everyone came in with something that, that showed that. And you know, some of them were very disappointed. Uh, we had one case where a mother came in time and time again with her things and her daughters. And the mothers were pitiful, but the daughters got better and better. And we finally started having shows of the daughters that were very successful <laughs> and not the mother. I, you know, mm. uh, it was, we, we were doing that. Mm. But when I got back into things here, I, Brandy and I have been involved in the pride movement here in Gainesville and always took part in the pride parades and a member of the pride uh, organization. Uh, and the pride parades were interesting because he was in a wheelchair all of the time that we were in the pride parades and I was pushing him. And I had little placards uh, that said something like, we're married and gave the number of years because we were married in 2004 on Martha's Vineyard when it became legal in Massachusetts. Uh, we did it. I can't say that we got personally a lot out of doing it except that young people, young people came to us and wanted to photograph us and talk to us. Uh, many of them had never seen gay couples that had been together for a long period of time. They had no idea that this, I certainly growing up never had any, anybody to look up to that I could mm. identify as being gay in a long-term thing. When Brandy died, we'd been together 51 years. Wow. Uh, so we did all the pride parades and uh, it really, I, I think it was an asset to the community to do it. Yeah. But th then I, I, I got involved and I, I went before the, well, I filled out forms to be on some sort of committee for the county and the city that had to do with environment. And the city, uh, the first one that they put me on was called the City Beautification Board that I'm still on, which isn't as active as I would like to see it. I'm trying to get it to be a little more active. And the second one is the Nature Centers Commission, and we're the oversight board for all of the nature centers in Gainesville, and there are a huge number of them. Okay. And it's that group that last night gave the Green Award to Oak Hammock. Okay. Then the county has appointed me to the uh, Environmental Protection Advisory Committee, EPAC, and also the Land Conservation Board, which picks out parcels of land that we think the county should purchase with some of the funds from the wild spaces, public places. Mm -hmm. That's a very meaty board to be on uh, to make these decisions. And a lot of it has to do with parcels along the Santa Fe River and the other mm -hmm. rivers, uh, and also connectivity, trying to connect corridors for wildlife. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, 
it takes that. Then a couple of years ago, well, several years ago, it must be three years now maybe, a place called Camp McConnell, which was a, a YMCA camp down at the Micanopy border that was owned by the YMCA of Palm Beach, had been out of business for several years. And the county thought that maybe it should buy it and hold it and turn it over to somebody who could run a camp. They tried this a little bit. I urged them right from the beginning to purchase it as a county, not to sell it. Uh, and what they've said is the pot that isn't camp property, which is close to 100 acres, I think, uh, is going to be in a conservation easement. So it's not going to be disturbed. Uh, the county entertained a couple of, of organizations that thought that they would like to run a camp in there, but nothing, nothing was quite right. So I urged the county to buy it. The county bought it. Then I urged the county, and I was very happy. Then I urged the county to encourage a nonprofit to assist in uh, making an awareness of this new camp and uh, perhaps doing some fundraising. Mm. Luckily, the county took the burden of fundraising off because the county appropriated money to rehabilitate these buildings. Some of these buildings go back to the 30s. Right. And they either needed to be rehabilitated, a couple of them have needed to be replaced. Uh, the swimming pool, the Olympic size swimming pool, had to be completely redone. That was gone. Uh, the, the lake, Lake George, the waterfront had grown up so you couldn't launch the canoes or anything like that. So there's a lot. But the county said yes. The assistant county manager, Gina Peebles, was uh, named to assist. And an organization called the Friends of Cuscoella, the county called the, the place now Cuscoella, which was the Indian name for there. Friends of Cuscoella was formed. Uh, I was made a director, yeah. even though I'm trying to get rid of some of these things. <laughs> uh, and last year, it took, it took a while. When you go to, through to be a 501c3 organization, to get the paperwork done, to get this done, to get it approved at the state, to get it at the national, all of this, we didn't get our 501c3 until April. Camp started in June. We did a quick fundraising, and we raised enough money so that none of the kids that went to camp last summer paid any tuition. It was $100 a child. It was just a day camp. Mm -hmm. and. At 9 o'clock this morning, I had another meeting of Camp of uh, Friends of Cuscoella, and we have a meeting next Thursday to discuss our fundraising for this coming year, which is going to be a combination of a day camp and an overnight camp. And we have to try to figure out how to allocate funds that we hope to raise, and probably will not do 100% funding this year, but try to, try to ask people to be honest about it and say, do they need some help or do they not need some help? Uh, for a nonprofit to try to do a, a means test is almost impossible. You can't do, we can't get things like uh, IRS records. Mm -hmm. I thought last year that maybe we could get the, lead, uh, the, the notice from the school department as to who gets free meals or something. No, mm -hmm. that's privilege. And so we couldn't do any of that. So I th think we're going to try to rely on, on what the parents say. Uh, and then we, have, and we haven't decided yet. Uh, when it first came up this year, some people thought that uh, they shouldn't, we shouldn't provide any money for overnight camp. Uh, somebody made the remark, well, rich kids go to overnight camp and not the poor <laughs> kids. Well, yeah, that may be because the poor kids can't afford to go to overnight camp. So I said, no, 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 no. If there are kids that meet the guidelines that can't afford the full the amount for overnight camp, we should be providing it. So that's one of the things I have to we have to hash out at the meeting next Thursday. You know, there, yeah, you, you don't get everybody to agree with everything all the time. <laughs> that's true. Uh, but I try to I try to look at a big picture and try to keep it as inclusive as possible. Uh, and to exclude somebody 
from overnight camp because they can't afford it is ridiculous. I, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't see any justification for it. Mm -hmm. Now, other people may, but I don't. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. I think we're probably going to have to come back. Yes. <laughs> we're out of time. You're running out of we're time. Running out of time. Yeah. Well, well, I'm sort of at the end of my, <laughs> the end of my life. <laughs> well, we, we did want to come back, uh, Vasilios. Uh, yes. We to um, make another appointment because uh, there's a lot more, obviously. Sure. <laughs> sure. Today. Sure. Yeah. And, um, Unfortunately, we have two more events. Oh boy, yeah. I'm sorry. No, I, no, not your I, I can go on and on because I've had this most interesting life. Yes, which is evidence. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. Oh, Good. Yeah, Good. it's a Good. lot of great work. The, the next thank time you, so you come much. back, perhaps, uh, if you don't mind clutter and mess, you might want to come to my apartment to photograph some of these other documents yeah, and things. Yeah, that would be great. Uh, the only reason I brought these, as I say, was I, I s often think that people are skeptical when they don't know people and uh, say, well, you know, nobody knows your background and you can make up whatever you want. And my background is so fantastic, there's no reason <laughs> people should, there's no reason people should believe it. Hmm. So. It's been great. Thank you so much <laughs> for welcome. your time, and it was an honor to, you know, well, thank you. you. I, thank you. I, you know, I've, I've, I've had it. I'm having an interesting life. Yes, well, this is great. Part one. <laughs> <laughs>